really important message that uh, really needs to be conveyed is all colleges, and this has been our history and will be our future, live and die with the quality of the engagement of the alumni. So we can do a bunch of stuff on campus, it's not as if this is independent of whether I do my job well or, uh, or not, but uh, uh, the work of the college is so much the work of the goodwill of people who are so dedicated to the future of this place that they're willing to give time and energy to, uh, to make it work. And I can be a little bit more specific about what I mean about some of those opportunities in, in just a second, but it's real. And, um, and it's easy to uh, identify the breadcrumbs that take, you know, in many ways, the best aspects of Bloyd College's success. And you know, I'm going way beyond the financials here, uh, of the quality of the experience for our students, and uh, tracing back to the goodwill talents and, um, uh, and quality of the people that the school had been able to attract in its past uh, and all that. Uh, uh, so if there's any takeaway from this, it's that and, uh, and um, as I said, there are some specifics about which you may have, have questions. Second thing is one of the, so striking to me and you know, I suspect you know, people from the development shop that are on the road can attest to this as well. Just so I spent my first year here uh, doing a relatively large number of meet the president sorts of, sorts of events. You go from place to place to place. We saw in every place where the lawyers across generations, most of the time, would never met each other uh, at all, and took maybe all of 10 seconds for, you know, not just a, a, what was a major kind of conversation, but a soft, substantive conversation about what people cared about, what was important in their lives, and how had Lloyd made, made a difference. And the ability of this college to create a pathway and enough of a connection across generations so that people can talk to each other in real ways and connect to each other in authentic ways uh, is so important. And, you know, you know, so why don't we hire a bunch of people to do what volunteers do? I mean, your time is enormously valuable. And nothing conceptually would stop us from hiring a, we could outsource the work that volunteers do. But it wouldn't work. And it wouldn't work because you have a shared experience, you have a language, you have a way of connecting, even across 50 years of difference and when you were here, that makes all the difference in the world and the nuanced way in which people understand each other as people who have lived this experience can never be captured and uh, there is not a substitute for the work of the volunteers. So we couldn't pay enough to hire a talented enough person to do the work that is necessary through the volunteers that um, do such glorious things uh, uh, for us in this uh, uh, in the steps. Those are those are two things that now I'm going to engage in something that's you know a little bit of a non sequitur. Um, so, what is in this college's DNA? Uh, and uh, you can go back to we were one of the oldest colleges in the Midwest. We're, you know, we were born before the state was born. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there's, there's this glorious, practical, Midwestern quality to, to this place. You don't see it in Amherst, uh, uh, but you see it at Bloke. At the outset, we were a place that was engaged in the liberal arts because we thought the liberal arts was practically, functionally, real world of value to the world at hand. And that was the vision of Chapin. It was even more the vision of Eaton. Uh, and in many ways, you know, Chapin kept the college going. Eaton gave it a vision. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Eaton was smack dab. And if you look at American higher education, the most important element of American higher edu education were the schools that adopted a Thomas Dewey approach to education versus the schools that did not. 
theory and practice. Theory and practice. So there's much to Thomas Dewey, but at the core, the one sentence version, that's what it's called. And Beloit College was there, it was there before Dewey was there. Didn't articulate it in the way that, uh, that he did, but we embraced it with all of our heart and soul. George Colley, who was the son of the uh, first of the three students that came to, uh, uh, Joseph Colley, that came to school. George Colley was, of course, you know, the founder of geology at Beloit in uh, arguably much of, uh, of America as an academic discipline, was the dean of the college, was the, uh, the dean who, who famously <laughs> blindsided his president to say, we need to be a school that's 60% international. Why? Because we need to connect to the world. Why? Because that's the value of a practical education, that a liberal arts education needs to connect to the world, and we can't ignore uh, uh, you know, our region, we can't ignore the country, but we can't ignore the world in which we operate. You know, all of this, it's not as if the Beloit plan was born out of whole cloth. The Beloit plan was an evolutionary process that came through the founding of the college, through an embracing of Dewey, to a conversation around internationalism, to the Beloit plan. And the Beloit plan then actualized uh, uh, and, and, and brought into greater relief relative to the rest of the country. This, um, uh, this importance of experience as a critical piece of your education. The Boyd Pan, for reasons that, um, uh, that I think historically, until relatively recently, have not been well understood uh, on this campus, the Boyd Plan fell apart, not for any educational, pedagogical uh, uh, reason, not for any reason that was truly important at the heart and soul of what the Blood Plan was. It fell apart because we made a prediction about what could happen to enrollments at exactly the worst time in higher education in the, uh, in the early 70s. And uh, so it was a bad predictive model that, uh, about enrollment patterns in higher education in America that caused the issue of the Boyd Plan. Conceptually, you know, the oddity of, from 1980 until uh, moderately recently, the oddity of Blake College is we sort of, at least in, uh, in a public way, kind of backtrack from the glory of the Blake Plan, while the rest of the country embraced the Blake Plan. So the rest of the world said experiential education is our future. And Blake College publicly said, well, we're not so sure. But on the glorious side, the faculty kept saying, of course this is what it is that, that we need to do. And the faculty continued to deepen and become more sophisticated with this whole notion of experiential uh, education. And then, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I tried to do when I got here was try to understand the history of this place and try to dig into what I referenced a moment ago as the DNA. Uh, the place. What is central to what's distinctive and glorious and that is deep, deep, deep within our, um, uh, uh, within our bones. And uh, this, this centrality of the little arts of practice was where it was. It was easy to see. Once you, heard, and once you found language around it, it, it just kept becoming sharper and sharper and sharper. But this was the thing that was so central to uh, the history and the, uh, and the way we've evolved and the strength of this. I mean, you know, and it had to be true, it had to be true. You know, one piece of evidence, because you have 30 years of a faculty continuing to do it while it's uh, not being supported anywhere else. On the, uh, on, uh, on the campus. If everyone had evidence about the strength of this proposition, that's all you need to do. Look at the history of this college from 1980 until 2009. And, uh, and, uh, and you cannot get stronger evidence of what I just said is, uh, is true. Uh, so all we do is find language around it. And then uh, and finding like this is a non-trivial thing because if you had asked faculty what they were engaged in at the college, uh, uh, I think prior to Ann Davies sort of really sort of driving this uh, this whole thing, if you asked faculty what they were doing, asked 30 faculty, you would have gotten 30 different answers. You would have gotten answers that were provincial to their their programs, and it would have been a challenge for you to have been teased out what was common 
to those 30 different answers. And one of the power, one of the reasons why there's power to language is that if you can find the right words around things, then people see themselves within that language and they adopt it and there's a common way of thinking about it and that actually strengthens what it is that you're, uh, that you're trying to do. So, you know, if there's an accomplishment that, um, uh, that I'm proud of, it's sort of recognizing the dean's office language was really powerful language that spoke to the campus and spoke to its alumni and spoke to current students and uh, was part of the reason why people could talk to each other so authentically, so quickly, in the settings that they were talking to each other. So I go on long about this because it's actually really important to the future of, uh, of Lloyd College to understand this history. This isn't a fly-by-night thing. I mean, you know, the board could fire me tomorrow, and I promise you, whatever happened, it's still going to be a campus that lives and breathes the liberal arts of practice. So this is not a Scott Behrman thing, uh, and it's not an Ann Davies thing. It is a Beloit College thing, and other things may be put around it, but I'm so firmly convinced that this is in fact true. So how you sort of move ahead with this world has got to be sort of governed by this, this thing that orients us. So, so strong. So, uh, uh, so that, that's sort of my revelation in, uh, in all of this. And I, I, you know, having just come from a heritage lunch, not heritage society lunch, which is now the Jim Duffy Society uh, lunch, just a, a little bit ago. I mean, there's a reason why we renamed that society, and why we're so thrilled that Jim Duffy was allowed us to rename the society, because Jim Duffy sort of put into place the Duffy Community Partners, which is such a glorious example of the liberal arts and practice, that you know, now we've got a, you know, the name of a society that, uh, is, that, that opens up conversations all the time to this core thing that, uh, that we have in place. But, so fast forward then to um, the, uh, 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 the fundraising future of the college. But fundraising futures of the college are nothing more than priorities. So this is, you know, uh, people ask me in year one, what's your vision for the college? Well, it wasn't well articulated, it's much better articulated now. But I'd like to think that it's articulated in a way that is consistent with how we're imagining using resources. Uh, uh, going forward, this ought to connect to each other one to one as uh, as you go forward. So, um, uh, so a critical piece of the fundraising is connected to this project-based approach. So we want to be focused on what it is that uh, that we're doing. We want to raise money for things that we either don't want or cost more than uh, at the end of the day what you raise the money for to uh, put them into place. So one of the challenges with, and this is going to be a challenge to all volunteers, to the language of the liberal arts and practice is that it's become so powerful that it takes on multiple very different things. So, on the one hand, liberal arts and practice is a requirement that in uh, my first year in Ann Davies first year, uh, we had a curricular review, so sort of put into place uh, a new set of graduation requirements. And one of the requirements was that students have to have a liberal arts and practice experience sometime in their junior or senior uh, year. So uh, uh, they have to have some sort of out of classroom uh, uh, engagement that uh, is based on liberal arts foundations of thinking, but uh, is experiential in nature. So all campus studies can potentially fill this, fill this role. Internships have a pathway to fill this role. There's lots of possibilities that go uh, into this. But liberal arts and practice is a requirement. Secondly, liberal arts and practice is a physical center. So there's a building called the Liberal Arts and Practice Center. Charles Westerberg is director of the Liberal Arts and Practice Center. Carol Wickersham works in that building and provides uh, uh, a 
a kind of matching service between students and potential um, liberal arts and practice experiences, including liberal arts and practice requirement experiences. Um, uh, but it, it's a physical thing with human beings that are uh, uh, associated with. Liberal arts and practice is a concept. So it's a requirement, it's a center, and it's a concept. It's bigger than the center. It's bigger than a requirement. It's a philosophy about what an education can be, a core governing principle to what centers around, around the curriculum. And the way I was talking about it 10 minutes ago was the arts of practice as an educational philosophy. Uh, and then we've complicated the matter further by making the liberal arts of practice a module. Uh, uh, so you know, it was bad enough when we had three different concepts for the liberal arts of practice, and then we created a fourth uh, in order to, you know, uh, and it's testimony to the quality of a boy educated mind that we believe that you can process these multiple approaches to uh, thinking about what is identical language uh, that's, uh, that's in place. So what is this module then uh, actually uh, entail? And remember that there are six broad modules. So one of the modules is the Bloiter Fund, one of the modules is scholarships, one of the modules is the endowment, one of the modules is renewing the historic core, of uh, the deferred maintenance projects uh, on campus. One of the modules is the powerhouse, where I just came from, and then the last of the modules is the liberal arts practice. So it's sort of the programmatic piece of the mix of things that, that we're talking about. So intellectually, in some ways, it's the most interesting of, uh, of the module. So what is then in the liberal arts and practice module? Uh, and uh, the answer is that it has three essential elements that are embedded in. One of it is, can we think of a curriculum as being, one, not only disciplinary based, and two, ultimately flexible over time. Uh, so what we envision are um, uh, fellows circles, leadership circles, group. Curricular leadership circles that consist of faculty and staff and students that act as, um, as the center, think of, uh, think of, the, uh, of a curricular initiative as having concentric rings of engagement, where the heart of this and the center of the concentric ring are those people that are most deeply engaged in this curricular initiative, and then a set of other faculty that, that pay attention to it, staff and students that pay attention to it, but for which it may not be the centrality of their life and then out to a further ring of people that can talk about it but may not actually be engaged in if you're a faculty member teaching in, in the area. An example of this uh, uh, is sustainability. So we've got a group of faculty and staff and students that serve as core centerpieces of guiding and directing and providing leadership in lots of ways over issues of sustainability. We've got a lot of faculty, and staff, and students that are interested in issues of sustainability. So I'm interested in issues of sustainability. I'm not sure I'm going to teach a course in sustainability, but I might want to teach a week long section uh, on sustainability in my principles of economics uh, class. And I can really use some support in, uh, in doing that. And step that out uh, even further. Imagine that you then have sort of a curricular initiative around sustainability, a curricular initiative fellows program around uh, social identity and liberal inquiry. So key issue of our time is how do, we, how do we align ourselves with particular identities? How do I think about myself? I think about myself as an economist. I think about myself as a parent of, uh, of two children. I think of myself as a white male set of identities that, that guide us in a variety of ways that govern our lives, that govern our behavior, that govern our interactions with other people, cuts across all disciplines. That's a curricular, that can be a curricular initiative. So these fellows programs 
uh, allow us to identify core aspects of an education that cut across a student's life. Disciplines will still be there. It's just that this is a way of focusing in a cross-cutting way uh, uh, across different disciplines, cutting at core issues that students and faculty and staff uh, face. Fellows program, a critical part of the liberal arts of practice. Second part of the liberal arts of practice, opportunity grants. So if we believe in experiential education for our students, then we need to think seriously about how to give them resources to bring these opportunities to life. And opportunity grants are the approach that we envision that will be a vehicle for allowing that to, uh, to happen. So imagine a situation in which students have access, you know, uh, perhaps even an aspirational model in which students have uh, are entitled uh, at the point that they come to the college to, at least if they provide a sufficiently good proposal, to a two to $3,000 opportunity grant that frees them for a summer to actually be able to take an unpaid internship that allows them to take an off-campus studies program and extend it for three or four weeks and engage in a project-based uh, opportunity that uh, allows them to travel to Chicago on a regular basis to be part of a theater program. Might be going. The list goes on and on and on. That students have access to, they will come up with enormously creative ways to take advantage uh, of this. We don't have to be prescriptive about what these things are that they do. We have to monitor that. But that's fundamentally different from being prescriptive about about what these things are. And then the third piece of it, which connects to the other two pieces so importantly, are alumni connections. So. Uh, fellows program, opportunity grants, alumni connections. Because these things come to life, these opportunity grants, how do you make them work? How do you provide students with enough opportunities so that they actually aren't spending 90% of their time trying to find an opportunity? And the answer has to be through taking advantage of the generosity and skills and opportunities that alumni can put out there for our students. So, uh, 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 and that can happen in lots of ways. It can happen in big settings, uh, sort of versions of Econ Day that currently exist. And Econ Day is where it's a one day a year in which the uh, Econ faculty bring the juniors and seniors down to Chicago. They uh, have a chance to learn something about the economy connected to Chicago. Then they have a chance to connect with alumni for the better part of, uh, of a day. Uh, and it's an enormously important opportunity for our students to have those conversations with, uh, with an alumni. It's a chance for alumni to connect with students, of course, in reverse. Uh, and it's been hugely valuable to our economic students. Uh, well, there's no reason why we can't do that in other areas and other disciplines uh, or across disciplines, you know, arts day, you know, uh, and we have some of these in place, but we need more of them uh, in place. Job shadowing programs that we've uh, uh, put in place for you know, almost insanely small amounts of money. We've transformed students' lives. And we we spent a group, sent a group of students over to San Francisco to do some job shadowing in, in San Francisco. I think the budget for it, mean, yeah, I don't even want to think about uh, the quality of the planes that these people were on. But the, uh, the budget for this, I think, was uh, just a tad over $300 a student to, uh, uh, to make this happen. The students come back saying that, uh, that you know, their worldview of what it was they wanted to pathways forward was changed by, by the few days that they had in uh, San Francisco. We have faculty members who, there's a, uh, a, a job shadowing program went to New York in the arts. Uh, we have faculty members that aren't going to teach the same as a result of accompanying students on these. You see, these are unpredictably valuable experiences. You don't know where the outcome of this is going to go. You just know something good's going to happen out of, uh, out of out of the deal. But the list goes on and on and on. You know, advising days to take advantage of, of alumni connections. It's, uh, it's just a, sort of this endless array of how it is, here I go back to the DNA, that we bring the liberal arts and practice to life for our students. At the end of the day, the success, the depth of the success 
of what it is that we're trying to achieve here is ultimately desperately, deeply connected to our ability to tie together alumni and our students to bring this whole thing to life in the way that, uh, that we aspire to. It just seems so, the whole thing just for me, just seems to me to be tied together uh, so neatly and so, um, so authentically with the college's history and its roots and its strength and what we do at, uh, at Bullock College, it's sort of building on the generosity uh, uh, and the entrepreneurship of our alumni and our, and, and our current students. And at the end of the day, they own this experience. This is theirs. It is their education. I've sort of made the uh, uh, board people tears at commencement around this theme of this is your education that you've that you've created. That, that matters because anything else just drifts away. If it's not yours, it will not last. And this is what a real education means. It's pretty good. Uh, and we can be distinctive. Uh, uh, and in my opinion, uh, it's, uh, we've got a sophistication at uh, thinking about this and doing this that uh, transcends anybody else I know. So anyhow, that's how I uh, see, uh, and so I know that there's tons of stuff that, uh, that you know, are nuts and bolts say, around how can uh, volunteers be helped on the missions and development and uh, in um, career issues, which is sort of our top, and all that's real and, and, and connects to this broader conversation. It's not independent of this at all, but um, uh, I wasn't quite sure what to say. I thought sort of doing this at the, uh, at the conceptual level might be of some value.